So it's a funny slot you put me in here, um, but fortunately I don't think I'll take the whole 30 minutes up. Um, I've got nine slides, and I'm going to talk about caching techniques uh, with Lustre. So as we've been hearing for, from a few talks today, then there's a general broadening in the applicability of Lustre, so we get these continuous requests for um, being able to treat not just beautiful, large streaming I.O., but also uh, maybe less well-behaved applications and less well-behaved sorts of I.O. I'm going to talk about a small file problem in general. We've heard some um, treatment of this today, uh, various problems including platter usage efficiency, in fact not so bad for Lustre, Lustre's pretty good at that. Um, metadata performance, we've heard a lot about that. And what I'm going to talk about is small I.O. performance. In particular, uh, read performance. And the problem with uh, managing read performance in Lustre is you need some intelligence there to preload the data into some kind of cache before you read it. Otherwise, it's really not going to work. So at DDN, we've been doing some uh, work on this. And we've created something called the Lustre FAdvise framework. Um, so who in the audience have heard of FAdvise and has some familiarity with what that's doing? Okay, a few of you, good. So there is something called POSIX FAdvise, um, which I think probably works with the Lustre client right now. This allows a user or an application to specify how it's about to read some data. So you can specify um, a set of blocks or an offset or something and also tell the underlying backing device how it's expecting to use that data, whether it's going to be random or sequential uh, reads to that sort of data set. But if you run that POSIX FAdvise command on top of a Lustre client, then you'll end up with the, the file you're interested in moving into the RAM of the client. And that's not going to be too helpful, because the likelihood is that the next read is going to be from another node somewhere else. So we needed to modify this kind of framework so that we're using the global Lustre cache. So when we order up a file, it moves into some globally available Lustre cache in the file system. So this is um, in a state that's uh, kind of working. Uh, we fixed some bugs while we're doing the benchmarking, which I'll show you some results of. It's not available yet. We expect to put it back in the source tree, and in the tree uh, once we have the bugs fixed and uh, we've characterized it properly. It uses um, two areas currently of caching layers. And one is, as I mentioned, the RAM in the object storage servers. And the second one is uh, SSD. So you'll see this SFX in my slides. SFX is a DDN marketing name for um, our management of SSDs within the controller. So it's a little bit DDN specific, although the Lustre FAdvise framework is extensible. So whilst we have an implementation which is specific for DDN SSDs and they're in the, uh, using SFX cache, um, there's a generic application for this using the existing uh, oh, RAM in the object storage servers, plus using extensible framework. Others out there could use this. For example, Kevin might put a Fusion I.O. cards in his uh, nodes and then use this to preload those Fusion I.O. cards, for example. So this is my uh, diagram I stole off uh, Ihara. Um, so at the top here we have uh, Lustre Client. Then we have some object storage servers on the network. And then we have some kind of storage device. So the, the patch we've developed applies to the client because we need to modify the LFS command to support the FAdvise framework. There's also the IOCUTL API to allow the smart applications to do similar things through the API. There's been some small modifications to the LOV to allow this route through to the object storage clients and the OSSs. And then on this server side, there's uh, a little patch there to enable the data movement from back-end storage into memory or back-end storage into the SSD layer, this SFX layer. When you use FAdvise, there's various hints you can give to the system. Um, obviously, you can say do nothing, or you can say LFS advise cache, and using cache is basically asking for that blocks, those blocks to be moved into the OSS memory. You'll see there's three other hints here, low, medium, and high. And currently, these correspond to low, medium, and high priorities within our SSD cache. 
And of course, if you, uh, you can imagine this, I think, I don't need to explain it, but uh, if you move some data into the SSD cache with a high priority, it tends to stick there for a long time and not get pushed out by the LIU algorithm un unless there's an awful lot of other high priority data in that, that same SS SOX cache. So here's a benchmark setup. It's fairly small, so we did this uh, with the available equipment we had in Dusseldorf um, over the past few weeks. So Sven Troutman is in the back there. He's been running these codes, hiding um, in the back. Uh, it's made out of uh, a single SFA 7700. For those who don't know, this is our mid-range system. If you stack it full of disks, then it will approach something like 9 or 10 gigabytes a second luster throughput. But we only put 40 drives in there for this test. That's all we had available. Um, if you can read this, nobody can read this apart from me, but if you could read it, you'd see it says times 40 nearline SAS drives, and there's two SSDs, two pliant SSDs in there as well, which we're going to use as our SSD cache for this benchmark test. Then we've got two object storage servers attached by InfiniBand to the SFA7800, um, serving out uh, this patched version of Lustre 2.4. And then those are connected in turn through an InfiniBand switch to our, our single client. And in fact, uh, we pushed the boat out and found an extra client, so we actually had two clients for this test. I know it sounds a bit small, but uh, it seemed to work out. For, you'll see the results. So we set up this benchmark system, pretty simple, fairly small. We use the IOR benchmark. And we use these flags described here such that what the, the plan is that we create a, a large or many large files, reasonably large, I mean a few gigabytes, and then the client threads then concurrently do random reads of varying transfer sizes into that file or those set of files. And then, of course, we compare the state of that benchmark when we run it with no acceleration to the case where we use LFS FAdvise to promote the data in advance to the SSD cache or promote the data in advance to the object storage server RAM. And we make very sure that between all these tests we run, we clear all the caches throughout the system so we're not having some auto-magic kind of mess up our results. So hold on to your cerebellums. We're going to look at some uh, graphs. So there's three areas of this slide. The plots here, some words describing what we did, and my diagram kind of describing what we did. So let me explain the diagram. So we have a client with a number of threads, two object storage servers, the storage system. And in the storage system, you see we've got these 40 drives, and they're arranged in four LUNs. Each LUN is 10 drives in a RAID 6 format. And then we export that. Um, set of four LUNs, present them out to the two object storage servers, so each sees two OSTs. And then in, a, in addition, we've got these two red SSDs here. And I cleverly coordinated the numbering system on the diagram with the colors of the graphs. So number one is where the file, which is a yellow square, is sitting on a single OST. And you can see the data over here, the blue bits. Number two is in red. This is where we've promoted that file and copied it into the SSD cache. And we can see the red lines here. And number three, we've gone a step further. We're going to take that right up to the OSS RAM, and you can see results there. OK, so everybody's probably understanding what's going on now. Let's see some nods. Yes, I saw one nod. Three, three nods. So then the graphs. Let's explain these. So this is a throughput graph. So straight IOR output in terms of megabytes per second. And then what I did was I just basically inverted the small transfer size values to give you the IOPS figure. And the reason I did that is it just looks clearer um, to see what's going on at this critical region of small IOs. And the nice thing about this result is it's entirely comprehensible, um, just using logic. So the disk, I can actually point some arrows at the graph now, I think. Our file currently is sitting on a single OST, which has 10 drives. So the limitation of a single drive, in your minds, you have something like 100 IOPS of a single drive, maybe a bit more. So our limitation of our LUN is about 1,000 IOPS for this file. Um, and you see that down here. It's about 1,000 IOPS, this blue line here for small IOs. 
And the limitation for this is not a very well optimized system for disks. We haven't used the large IO patches, etc. But nevertheless, we get to something like 500 megasecond for this single line with a single file being attacked with, four, with this large IOs. So here we've got f 4 meg uh, reads, here's 4K reads. So we're, we're varying the transfer size and seeing the effect. So one point to note, like this blue uh, flag is saying, we've only got two SSDs in the system, so we haven't got the highest throughput in the world in terms of SSDs. And basically, um, when we're doing large transfers, then you might as well keep the stuff on disk because the SSDs ain't really helping you. There's only two of them. But when you're doing small IOs, then you can see, look at the IOPS values, and we're up to 30,000 IOPS with the two SSDs, and we're down at about 1,000 IOPS with your disk. So in this case, if you had a, a use case very similar to this, then it would be a very sensible thing to promote your data into the SFX, into the SSD cache. If you really wanted to set things on fire, then you could put it into the RAM. So the, the green lines show what happens when you promote that file into RAM, and it's sitting there ready on the object storage server to be read randomly by the application. And of course, we get humongous results, um, over 70,000 uh, IOPS from the RAM there. It's a fairly simple test. Uh, one more point. Yeah, so okay, we get a very large improvement. But it's a, it's a particular case because we've used a file that fits in the object storage server RAM, and maybe you're thinking, well, this is a bit, a bit special. So we um, tried another test where we created a very large file to see the effect of that. And again, it's very obvious what's happening here. So the large file is denoted by my increased size of my yellow uh, square, which is now a rectangle. And we could either be on this single lung, or it can be moved into the SSDs, or it can be fitted into RAM. But it can't be fitted into RAM because it's too big. It's a 128 gig file. We've only got 32 gig on the OSSs. And that's reflected nicely in the graphs because you can see the memory, the green and the blue lines. Um, so the green lines is looking at the RAM um, when we try and make the file move into the RAM. And of course, it's just page fonting all the time, and so we just see the disk performance here. But we still get benefits from using the um, two SSDs, particularly, of course, for small IOs. So again, it's a fairly limited case, and we have one more benchmark. So we've not done an exhaustive benchmark, just been the last couple of weeks, so we have more to do. Um, but the final benchmark was where we did something, again, a little bit more realistic even. And this time we created 16 8 gig files with a stripe count one, and we just balanced them across all the OSTs. So now at least we're using <coughs> all the drives in the test. So here is our state one, where we have these 16 8 gig files spread across the four OSTs, and uh, we see the throughput going up here to about 1200 megabytes a second uh, throughput from the, from the entire uh, system. Second case, we have the files moving to the SSD cache. We can do that, they will fit. We've got a couple of SSDs, I can't remember how large they were, but probably 400 gig or something in total, so only 600. And then in the last case, we try to move them into RAM. Again, there's not enough space, so this doesn't help whatsoever. So you see the case where, again, the RAM results are basically mirroring the disk results. But the SSD results are performing quite nicely. Conclusions, and it's nearly beer time. So we've created a fairly simple uh, framework called Luster F Advise, and it provides a useful performance enhancement for small I.O. reads. And it can help some larger I.O.s as long as we take care to analyze the architecture and look at how many spindles we got and how many spindles the file striped across and compare that to the throughput and IOPS of the SSDs. The larger data sets, obviously, we can try to put them in RAM, but we need a lot of RAM there. So that may not be practical. So really, the most practical way of implementing this is either have a very specific case um, where you can place relatively small but very randomly accessed and very important files into RAM, or you invest a small amount in a small number of SSDs to give you a relatively large, let's say, a terabyte or so of SSD-based cache. You don't get quite the performance of the RAM, but it's, it's a lot better for small IOPS than the, the disk was. And then four and five are kind of my final points, really. So we basically proved this works. It was going to work, um, but we've got this framework now to be able to implement it in practice. There's a big question in my mind about the applicability of this in real-world environments, because you have complex user environments, complex users. You've got limited cache resources, limited RAM, limited SSDs. So in some way, we need to manage the usage of that cache, either through the scheduler or through some other means. So. Um, 
If any of this uh, rings a bell and you think that you might have an application running this sort of I.O., we'll be pleased to talk to you and discuss how we can implement this kind of F-Advise framework into your scheduling system. And then maybe next time we can give you a report on how this can be impact, how this can impact real-world uh, scheduling environments. Thank you. I'm showing my laser pen at you. So, uh, I think your graphs don't add up. <laughs> Sorry? Your graphs don't seem to be adding up if you go to that nice one where you add threads and you kind of have increasing numbers, but you do know there's only eight RPCs per OST possible, and even if you, you are using four OSTs, is what I heard, that's go going to kind of being limited at 32 requests in flight. Sorry, this, um, there's a bit of an echo up here. I can't quite hear the question. So I see you are scaling the number of threads all the way to like 2,000s or something, uh, and you, we see no, the, increased... No, the, no, the number of th no, that's not the number of threads. That's the I.O. size. This is the transfer size on the bottom axis. Not number of threads. Oh, okay. Then. Sorry, my. So, um, how many threads are there then? How many threads? It says many threads. So, it's 16 or 32. Small numbers. Okay, yeah. Then. We only had two servers. Okay. Uh, there was another question I just had in my mind. So, uh, you do this RAM caching on OSS, but. On the other hand, since you run everything from a client, it seems there is a natural next step that you didn't take, which is just to pre-read the entire file into the client RAM, and then would be, then you will see even faster speeds. Exactly, completely correct. But um, uh, as I mentioned before, we don't really want to load up all the clients in in the compute system with the data, and we generally have a number of threads on different compute nodes around the compute cluster. So we want to, the whole point of this is to raise the specific files within the global cache, where it's globally available to all threads. But yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thanks. I don't get to choose who goes next. With the uh, SFX, you normally have four modes. So are you presetting the read mode on the controller initially, or are you actually doing what the LFSF advise? Sorry. So this, this echo is not too good for me. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. With the SFX, there's actually four modes. One is read mode. Are you setting that initially on the controller, or are you actually using through the LFSF advise? Yeah. With, within SFX, we support a number of priorities. Um, uh, and basically, there's, there's high, medium, and low, and we just expose those up through Lustre F Advice. So you have the same high, medium, and low, and you have an extra option, which is move it into RAM rather than into SFX. Does that make sense? And if it's high, then of course it just stays in, in the cache longer and it competes with other, well, it, it wins in the competition with low and medium priority objects. Hi, uh, I'm thinking of uh, real working environments. Uh, have you given any thought to automatically triggering F advice in a dynamic way in a running environment? I think that will be something very cool. Uh, it would be cool, wouldn't it? So I'm kind of familiar with some scheduling systems, particularly Grid Engine, because I used to work for Sun for a while. And that has something called JSV, Job Submission Verifier, which allows you at submission time to interrogate scripts and have a look at things. So in theory, it maybe it sounds a bit complex for people who actually run systems, but for people who are theoretical like me, in theory it seems that you could have some intelligence around what the user was requesting and maybe decide or not decide to run LFS advice on that based on that intelligence. But yeah, that would, be the, that's, that would be the perfect kind of problem we'd like to investigate further. So actually, uh, my question is, uh, does OST realize the SSD and the memory cache in your test? So um, uh, does OST know 
there's a, a SSD cache and a memory memory no. cache. No. So how how do you implement this? Because it's the con so the uh, the device that's mounted is mounted through. <coughs> It's, it's presented by the storage array into the object storage service. This is a device. So it's the controller intelligence that decides, uh, that knows it's got a copy of these blocks in SSDs and then passes that through. So the, the higher level luster is not aware of, of what's happening underneath. But you, 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 I think you need a way Yes, yes, so that's exactly correct. So the FAdvise links into the SFX um, block management system. Yeah. yeah. One more over here. Uh, building off the previous question, um, rather than integrating with the batch system, what about more of a policy uh, smarts that all the information is in the file system? So for example, if one file within a directory is touched, then you would consider all files that were smaller than some size uh, promoting those into cache or any other policy like that. Sounds nice. Does it fit within the framework? <laughs> no, it could fit with the framework, yes, and absolutely it could. Um, my mind's been on schedulers giving my background, but um, so, so how would you determine in your, your uh, ideal world Oh, good. Well done, Ashley. We've done a prototype of exactly that. Yeah, so you could use pools or directories and label those as ones that should be accelerated. Okay. Must be beer time now. All right, I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.